Well, friends, it's always good to be in the presence of the Lord, to worship Him, and to sing His praises, to sense His presence. I'm looking forward to the day then we will literally enjoy His presence with all of God's people, never to be parted from Him again. It's hard to take in. We love it when we, there's a tremendous sense of God's presence in, in our service. Oh, that was wonderful. But think of it. All eternity, there'll never be a moment we'll be without His presence. That's hard for our finite minds to take in. But it's the truth, hallelujah. And we're going to read in the New Testament from 1 Peter and chapter 5, please. 1 Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 6. And Peter writes to the believers, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same, same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And that's not the end of Peter's epistle. He's still got a little bit to go, a few more verses, but he got so caught up with it. He just had to bring a doxology right away to the Lord. The few verses that I've read together this morning, you say, okay, we've read that before. I recognize, especially parts of it. The title of the message is something that I'm sure will help and guide us. Very often in the Christian life, we wonder, what's the best way to do this? What's the best way to do that? And am I right in doing this? Am I right in doing that? And we want to know, and I'm sure as God's people, I'm sure you and I want to do God's perfect will. We, do, we want to do what he wants. We don't want to do what anybody else wants. And we don't want to even do what we want. And it goes against what the Lord desires for us. The title of the message is A Perfect Formula for the Believer's Victory. A perfect formula for the believer's victory. And the reason why it's perfect, because it comes from the perfect Word of God. That's the reason why we can look at this this morning. And there's four things I want us to look at, uh, people, today. Four things for the child of God that we are to be. All right? We are to be. Forget the, forget the uh, to be or not to be. That is the question. Forget that. Put Shakespeare out of your mind right now. But the Bible shows four things but as God's people, we are to be. There are things in the Christian life which we cannot do for ourselves. The Lord has to do them, and we rely upon the Lord. But you know, there are things for the Christian believer that we can do for ourselves, and we're to do them. And the Lord will not do for us what we can do for ourselves. It's no good using that very lame and very weak prayer. Well, Lord, if it's your will, please make me do this. Or, Lord, if it's your will, then let it happen in my life. That is not a prayer. That's standing with your fingers crossed and saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't want you to do this in my life. But we, there are things that we can do as God's people and we're responsible for in our lives. The first one we see here is found in verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. The first thing we're to be as God's people, we are to be submissive. We're to surrender. Now that's something that the world doesn't like to hear, especially in this world we're living in right now. To be submissive to someone else, oh, no, no. To surrender to someone else, no, no, no. I've got my rights. You need to know, friends, in the kingdom of God, there are no rights. It's all about Jesus. But he's perfect, 
and loves us and watches over us and protects us and provides for us in every way. But we're to be submissive. It says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. You and I are to do that. And I've mentioned before here, not so long ago in fact, never, never pray that very foolish prayer, Lord, humble me. Never pray that, friends. That's a dangerous prayer to pray because you don't know what you're praying. It's better for you to humble yourself as a child of God to do that. Far better. In fact, it says, and seriously, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. What does that mean? We can ask a question, what does that really mean? As, as, as I've already alluded to, James chapter 4, verse 7 says to the believers, submit to God. Submit yourselves to God. That is right away the way to humble yourself. Submitting to God. Lord, I can't do it. I need your help. Lord, I tried, I failed, but Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm trusting you, Lord. Lord, I'm looking to you. That's being submissive to God. You're looking to the Lord, and you're placing your life in his hands. And as a Christian believer, that's what we should be doing constantly. We're to be submissive. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. In fact, look at the, the end of verse 5 before this. And Peter quotes from the Old Testament, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if anybody's proud and full of pride, God resists them right away. It's the humble that he gives grace to. I'm sure you and I would want more of God's grace. Isn't that right? Well, the secret is, the cat's out of the bag now, okay? And what it is, the more you humble yourself, the more grace you'll get from the Lord. Humble yourself more, he'll give you more grace. In fact, when it says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, here's what it literally means. God sets himself against the proud. God sets himself against the arrogant person but gives grace to the humble. Isn't that wonderful? He's promised to do that. See, you find this in the Word of God, this constant pattern. God will say, beware of this, beware of that, don't do this, don't do that, but doesn't leave it there. This is where the world makes the big mistake. They think, oh, being a Christian, is don't do this, don't do that. No, the Lord is telling these things because they're bad for us, but the Lord doesn't finish there. He says, but I want to give you this in place of it, which is far better. And it's better for you. It's healthier. And you're going to have a better life. God never stops from a person, but he always replaces it with something better. And he replaces it with himself. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying there. Luke 22, verse 42, he prayed this, Father, if it is your will, remove this cup, remove this cup of suffering from me. Notice what he said then. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was completely submissive in his entire human life here. When he came into this world, he was submissive to the will of his heavenly Father. And what a tremendous pattern, example, that is to us as God's people. And we are to be the same. We should say, Lord, it's not my will, but let your will be done. Remember what Jesus said in that prayer as a, a pattern, an example prayer for the disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In fact, it was John the Baptist who said in John 3 and verse 30, he said of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. Think of Christ's mother upon earth, Mary. We're coming up to this Christmas season soon. When the angel Gabriel walked into her house one day, and in Luke chapter 1 verse 38, she responds after all that Gabriel reveals to Mary. Do you want Mary finished? by responding, let it be to me according to your word. And what was the word of Gabriel? It was the word of God. And as God's people, friends, we should constantly say, Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And every time you read the word of God, say, Lord, let that be to me according to your word. Let that be in my life, Lord. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Notice this, that he may exalt you in due time. He just doesn't want you to, to humble yourself and say, that's it, you stay down there, that's where you belong. No. He wants you to humble yourself so he'll give you grace, piled upon grace, as John's Gospel says in chapter 1. Grace piled upon grace, and that he may exalt you at the right time, 
in due time. You see, friends, in God's kingdom, here's the way it is. In God's kingdom, in order to go up, first you must go down. Everybody always wants to go up. You see it in the corporate world. They all want to get on top. They all want to step in everybody to get to the top. But in the kingdom of, of God, first of all, you've got to go down before you go up. That's the way of the kingdom. That's the way of, we are to be submissive. Secondly, not only are we to be submissive as God's people, but we're also to be solicitude-free. Now, a, that's a fancy word. I, I can't remember the last time I, I used it, but solicitude, it simply means care, worry. Because look at what it says, verse 7. Casting all your care on Him, because He cares for you. We are to be solicitude-free. Casting all your care. In the Greek, it literally is casting all your anxiety upon the Lord. Give it all to Jesus. Casting all your anxiety upon Jesus because he cares for you. In the Greek New Testament, it literally reads, cast your care, all your care on him because to him it matters concerning you. Isn't that beautiful? Because to him it matters concerning you. Do you know that you are the apple of his eye as God's people. The church of Jesus Christ, as well as the nation of Israel, were the apple of God's eye. Hallelujah. And so when we put our trust in Jesus, when we give our life to him as a child of God, we are precious to him. Not, there is, not that there is anything worthwhile in us to love or save, but he wants to save us anyway. And he called us to himself. And he says, it says, because to him it matters concerning you. You matter to Jesus in the way you live and the way that you walk in your Christian life. Casting all your care on him because he cares for you. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says three times in that chapter to the people, do not worry. Do not worry. How many times... To read God, do not worry. He said, oh, don't, don't worry, okay. Oh, I'll just take some of that worry with me again. And we take it with us. And sometimes, sadly, we wear it like a badge. I'm worrying far more than you are. Because I care more than all these other wretches around me. I care because I'm worried. I, 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 I'm, in fact, I'm almost feeling sick in my stomach because I care so much. Because I worry and worry and worry. Friends, there are, no, there are no crowns in heaven for worrying. All right? The Lord will never say on that day, well worried, thou good and faithful servant. Never. Because worry is not for the child of God to take part in. It's not good for us. Worry brings other symptoms. It brings stress and other things upon our bodies and our minds. We don't want to do with that. And Jesus said three times in Matthew chapter 6, do not worry. Now, if he said it three times in the space of a few verses, don't you think he was trying to tell us something? Do not worry. In fact, the same word that, Greek word that's used there, do not worry, is the same Greek word used in 1 Peter 5 in our reading. Casting all your care, casting all your worry, casting all your anxiety upon Jesus. Why? Because he cares for you. He's concerned about you. He's concerned about you. In fact, in Matthew 6 and 31, Jesus said to the people, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? And we might think, Well, that's a bit, that's a bit silly because I've got no frills or food line. I'm okay. Well, we haven't got a clothes shop, have we? But there you are. But all these things, we can travel and we can buy things. But what was Jesus saying? Don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? He was speaking of the basic necessities of life. The things which we are, are, are the basic. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Trust me, I will take care of it. And so we're to do that. And so we're to realize that Jesus cares about us. And Matthew 6 and 34, a few verses down, Jesus goes on to say, in fact, do not worry about tomorrow. Now what a, what a, a statement, what a, 
a verse from God's word for this world today. Do not worry about tomorrow. We've got nations, we've got governments are running around in circles wondering what to do. All the rest of it. Friends, don't worry about tomorrow. God's got it all in hand. He knows what will take place. In fact, God's word says, there in Proverbs, it says, do not boast yourself about tomorrow because you do not know what a day will bring forth. You and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Let's trust God for today. Let's not worry about tomorrow. Let's know Jesus today and trust him in that way. In fact, in Philippians 4 and verse 6, Paul writing to the Christian believer says, at Philippi, he says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. So the word of God tells us one thing to be anxious about, and that's nothing. <laughs> what it's saying is, do not worry about anything. Do not worry. We're to be solicitude-free. We're not to worry. We're to be submissive. We're to be solicitude-free. Thirdly, the Bible says for God's people, and it tells us that we're to be self-controlled. Self-controlled. Look at verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We're to be self-controlled. That's what the word sober means. Literally, the word sober in Greek means be free from influence. Don't let other people influence you instead of the Lord. Don't let your own flesh influence you instead of the Lord. But let God's Holy Spirit constantly influence you and be sober, be self-controlled. Self-control is one of the graces of the fruit of the Spirit. Self-control. In fact, it's the last one there, self-control. Again, God will not make us do something we can do ourselves. Because with the Holy Spirit's help, we are able to exercise self-control. When we say, oh, I, couldn't, I just couldn't help, couldn't help it. Yes, you couldn't, because that was your flesh. And that's why you couldn't help it. But with the Holy Spirit's help, you can always have self-control. The Word of God promises it. Be sober. Be vigilant. That simply means be watchful. Be watchful. What the Word of God is reminding us here, friends, that we're to do, notice it says, be sober. Be vigilant. The Word of God is saying here, do not be passive. Do not be inactive. There are a lot of religious people, and some of them call themselves Christian, think, well, you know, I, I do as Jesus says. You know, don't do anybody any harm. That's not what Jesus said. Because that's a negative statement. Don't do anybody any harm. What Jesus did say was proactive. He said, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And that's a completely different world right there. So the word of God here is proactive. It's not passive. It's saying to us as Christian believers, we are to be sober. We're to be vigilant. We're to be self-controlled. We're to be watchful. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 16 and 13, Paul says to the believers in Corinth, he says to them, watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Four positive actions there. He said to them in the space of a short phrase, first of all, watch. Secondly, stand firm in the faith. Thirdly, be brave. Fourthly, be strong. It's all proactive. Do you know why? Because you can have your strength in the Lord. That's why it can be done. That's why it can be done. In fact, Paul said in Ephesians 6 and 13, he said, listen, take up the whole armor of God. Take up the complete armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. What day is the evil day? The day when you're having a really hard day. The enemy's attacking you and you're being attacked even through other people by the enemy. It's all against you and you don't know what to do. The Bible says that's the evil day and you're to withstand. And it says, and having done all to stand. And it's almost like, Lord, Lord, I can't do any more. What else can I do? The Word of God says, just keep standing. Don't keep standing. Don't expect there to be a, a, a wonderful, tremendous Miracle just to lift you out of the situation, carry. The Lord has promised to be with you in that circumstance. He goes into it with you, he stays with you, and he comes out with you in it as well. So he's there all the time. And having done all, keep standing. 
Keep trusting the Lord. Be self-controlled. So it says, be sober, be vigilant. Here's the reason why. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Your adversary, the devil. Mentioned this before. The word devil there means accuser, slanderer. What's he doing? He's walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's constantly wanting to slander the child of God. He's constantly wanting to accuse. Oh, you did that wrong. Oh, you were no good at that. Oh, you're rubbish at this. You're no, no good at that. Oh, you, you're a terrible Christian. So on and so forth. Constantly. As I mentioned before, the best, one of the best ways is simply agree with the devil when he says those things. And say, yeah, that's right. But I got Jesus. That's right, but I got the Lord. And he's accusing you. And say, yeah, but I've got Jesus. And I stand in him. I stand in Jesus. And everything else doesn't matter to me because I am sober and vigilant in Jesus Christ. You see, friends, the Bible says there, your adversary, the devil. By the way, you do know the devil's your adversary, don't you? The parts of society to say, you know, you need to start worshiping the devil. You need to start doing what he's saying. And you know, there's a lot of good things uh, in uh, witchcraft and new age. There's a lot of good things. That, no, there's not, friends. He's your adversary. As he said to, as Jesus said on one occasion, Peter, I want you to know this. Satan has asked for you, Peter. You say, well, how's that? He's asked for you, Peter, because he wants to sift you like wheat. And that basically means this. Without going into the agriculture way of doing it, sifting the wheat, is that when they would get the, the husks and the wheat, they throw it up in the air, the good bits, the wheat, which was heavier, would fall in again. But the, the husks, when they threw up into the air when there was a wind, the wind would take the husks away. And Jesus was saying, Peter, Satan wants to take all the goodness out of your life and leave you with husks. He wants to leave you empty. He wants to leave you with absolute garbage in your life. But I have prayed for you, said Jesus. And Jesus is praying for us, hallelujah. And the great thing is, friends, to know who your enemy is. The first thing before a military situation takes place, before an army goes into battle, before they even start to, you know what happens? The first thing is, who's our enemy? Know your enemy. Know who it is. And it says that your adversary, your enemy, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Have you ever noticed this? Satan makes a lot of noise. He makes a lot of noise. Do you know why he does that? He loves to intimidate. His number one weapon is fear. And basically, that's his, that's his most effective weapon because basically that's all he's got. And if he can worry and frighten and intimidate God's people, he's got you. And he will keep at you if you don't know the formula for victory in the Christian life. He will constantly seek to attack with fear. And all it takes, you know, the Word of God talks about, talks, doesn't it say about the, the powers in the, the tongue? Remember that? The word of the tongue? The, the power is there? And how that? Just that. And suddenly, when someone says something negative, the first thing is, oh, it must be true. No, you stand against it. In the name of Jesus. Satan makes a lot of noise. A lot of noise. You see, that's the way the world thinks. The world thinks the louder you shout, the more authoritative you are. But not in God's kingdom. Not in God's kingdom. In the book of, in the book of 1 Kings, when Elijah went off, Elijah thought that he was the only one who was left in all of Israel. He, through, through, through the, by the Lord, the Lord through Elijah had defeated the, the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. And they were all slain. And the Lord was victorious. And, and the people of God, Israel, turned back to the Lord. Because they realized, well, there's no point in going back to Baal because he's been defeated. So they turned to the Lord. And then, for a while, Elijah was in the strength of the Lord. But then a, a word came from Queen Jezebel. 
May it happen to me, if not by this time tomorrow, I will have your life. And what happened? Elijah believed it. He got up and he ran into the wilderness. He ran into the desert. He ran for his life. And there he was. He, w- he, went, into, he went into complete shutdown, as it were. And depression came upon him because he put himself in that position. And by the way, just to say, depression is not against the Word of God, okay? There, is a, there are depressions which are sicknesses. It's just like having a broken leg. It's just that you can't put a, a Band-Aid on depression, okay? But Elijah was in depression. And he, the Lord sent an angel, fed him for days. Then what happened is, he began to walk near this particular mountain the Lord took him to. What happened was there was a tremendous earthquake one time. It says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then there was a tremendous fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. A tremendous wind, but the Lord was not in the wind. Then it says, but after the, the fire, there was a still, small voice. That was the Lord. It wasn't all about the noise and the furore. In the midst of all that, the Lord whispered to Elijah. You see, what Elijah needed at that point was nobody pounding him with a loud voice, like at Moses on Mount Sinai. This is the law. He didn't need that. The Spirit of God just quietly spoke to him, and he received it. And that was, that was the start of Elijah's healing and being brought back to being effective for the Lord himself. Satan makes a lot of noise, but it's what the Lord says which is authoritative and which is powerful. We're to be self-controlled. And fourthly and lastly, friends, you come to verse 9. It says, resist him. Who? Resist the devil, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings that are experienced by your brother are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So what does verse 9 tell us we're to be? I kind of put this in with tongue and cheek. I thought, this will be a good one. We are to be stubborn. We're not in the flesh, but with the strength of the Lord. We're to be stubborn against the enemy. Not stubborn against each other in the kingdom of God. Not for, definitely not to be stubborn with the Lord. Because in fact, the Bible says in the Old Testament that stubbornness is idolatry. Do you know why? Because stubbornness says, well, I want my way, and I'm God. I will just do it my way. Stubbornness is idolatry. But here we see it in the positive way. We are to be stubborn. Because the word of God says regarding the devil, our adversary, it says resist him. We are to be resistance fighters. We're to stand against the enemy. Again, Ephesians 6 and 13. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. That phrase, to withstand, is the same Greek word here and in verse 5, which refers to God when it says that the Lord, He resists the proud. He opposes the proud. He resists. He literally sets Himself against. And that's what you and I as Christian believers were to do. We are to set ourselves against the devil. Now notice this. We say we're to stand. Set ourselves against the devil. We're not to go running after him. We're not to go as some foolish Christians do. We're not to go chasing the devil. Do you know why? That shows you're taking it with him. You're giving more time to the devil than you are to Jesus. I've said before, don't pander to the devil. Don't let him take up your time. But if he crosses your path, deal with him and move on. It's as simple as that. He's not as important as he thinks he is. But he wants us to think that he's so important that he takes up most of our lives. No, definitely not. But we are to withstand. We are to oppose the enemy. We're to resist the devil. And Peter writes, resist him steadfast in the faith. Notice that. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Literally, in the Greek New Testament, it reads like this. Oppose him firm in the faith. See, if you're here today, if you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus, 
he's never been your Lord and Savior, then you cannot oppose the devil. You are chicken feed to the devil. And you may say, well, you know, I, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but I've never really had a problem with the devil. And another reason for that is because you're no threat to the devil. The one the enemy goes after, because the Bible says the whole world, all the people in the world, lie under Satan's sway. He's got them all swaying to his tune. But it's those who name the name of Jesus. Those are the ones that Satan's out to pull down. But if we oppose Satan firm in the faith, in the Word of God, in the Scriptures, as we saw last time when we said, Jesus said, it is written, then we'll be able to resist the devil. We are to be stubborn against the enemy. We're not to give ground. We're to say, and not to also turn. Notice it says Satan goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. A good friend of mine many years ago, a South African friend, he was in the military and he told me, he said, listen, Paul, we looked at the scripture together and he said, I remember one day I was out in the bush in South Africa. I'm just out by myself. And I got separated from a group of people I was with. And I went off to have a look and explore. And I turned around this bush, and suddenly there was this big male lion looking at me. And he said that I had to remember my training. He said, it started to prowl around, back and forward in front of me. And he said, and every, t every so often, it was eyeball to eyeball. And it would take its head down and prowl again. Look up again. And they said, the golden rule is, is that when you face a lion, and basically it's the only thing you can do, he said, you never take your eye off the lion. You keep at it. You keep looking at its eyes. And when it moves this way, you turn your body that way. Because by saying that, you're saying, I'm not giving you an inch. And because of that, he said, I said, I know it's a stupid question, but what happened? Right? He said, I faced the lion down. In the end, the eye lion got nervous. And it was a fully grown male lion. I said, turn and just head it off into the bush again. And he said, I was very happy. <laughs> but that's the same with the enemy, friends. When he tries to, just, to distract your attention, follow him. I tell, don't let him try and get behind you. Because that's the only part of God's armor which are not protected is the back. So always keep face to face with the enemy and don't give an inch. In fact, we read in the, the, last, the second last book of the Bible, Jude. It's tucked away in there after 3 John and Revelation. This is what it says there in verse 3. Jude writes, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. The word the phrase common salvation doesn't mean common as in, ah, it's not very important. It means they're belonging to several people who have this salvation. That's what it means. He said, I found it necessary to write to you, encouraging you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. We're to contend. We're to stand firm for it. We're to oppose for the glory of Jesus. The word contend there means to contend about a thing. As a combatant, we're to contest it like a fighter. There are times we are in, we're in that ring with the enemy. And we're not to give ground. We're like a combatant. It literally means in the Greek, we are to contend for the once delivered to the saints, faith. To contend for the once delivered to the saints faith. Continuing six verses down in Jude, verse 9, the writer records for us and says, Michael the archangel in contending this time was a different Greek word, contending with the devil. When he disputed, that means when he argued with the devil about the body of Moses. Moses had died at this point. It said that Michael, the great archangel, Michael dared not bring against Satan a reviling accusation. That means that Michael did not bring abusive criticism against Satan in passing judgment. Because Michael realized that was not his to give. But this is what Michael, the archangel, said 
to the devil? He said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. The Lord admonish you. The Lord criticize you. The Lord scold you, is what it literally means. The Lord tell you off. And this is what we're to do. Don't try and get into any debates with the enemy and all the rest of it and all that nonsense. Only once did Jesus actually have a conversation with, the, with, with demons, and that was the, the man from the Gadarenes. And Jesus did that to show the, the amazing power of his miracle that he was about to do. Because the demon spoke and, from the man and said, our name is Legion because we're many. Jesus wanted the people to hear that. And he said, be gone. Oh, oh, let us go to the swine, the herd of swine, so we can go there. And Jesus gave the command. Notice they couldn't leave until he said, go, go. And that's when the man was delivered and in his right mind. And friends, we're not to get into conversations, but Jesus, Jesus didn't dialogue, he delivered. That's what he did. He dealt with the enemy. And friends, the only thing that when the enemy ever comes against us, and let's remember, let's keep things in perspective. Do not be like some, some foolish Christians who say, oh, the devil's been at me all week again. The devil's done this. The devil's done I think to myself, wow, and I've, I've said to one or two people of this, you must be one of the most amazing and important people in the world. Because the devil is not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at one time. And yet with all the world, he's been at you all week. Boy, you must be an amazing Christian. Friends, let's not get arrogant. Let's remember our place in God's kingdom. Let's simply say, the Lord rebuke you. And when you do that, you quote the word of God and move on. And just leave the devil in your wake. In Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 27 to the believers, Stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together. That means contending together, laboring along with each other for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, by your enemies. Paul was able to say, writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and 7, Paul was able to say, I have fought the good fight. Don't you think when you read these things in the Word of God that Peter went through all this, uh, Paul went through all this? Of course he did. Paul did. Peter did. The disciples did it. All believers, they went through all this. We're praying for the persecuted church in the world today. Many of them are going through these very things. But they're resisting the enemy. And they're resisting the enemy steadfast in the faith. So listen, friends. Come to a close shortly. Resist Satan steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. It was Archbishop Layton who said, a born-again Christian, he writes, this, referring to the scripture, this is the truth, and taken altogether is a most comfortable truth. The whole brotherhood, the, king, the, the church of Jesus Christ, the whole brotherhood goes in this way, and our eldest brother went first. He went before us all friends. He knows exactly what we're going through because he experienced it first of all. Other brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter where, no matter when, are going through similar things as did our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation is overtaking you such as is common to mankind knowing that your brothers and sisters are joined with you and accomplishing God's purpose of all these sufferings. Verse 11 simply states, friends, after looking at a perfect formula for the believer's victory, it's to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So when we're victorious in our lives, when the Lord gives us victories from time to time, and it's wonderful, you say, oh, look what I did. No. Peter reminds us to Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's not about us, friends. It's about Him. It's about Jesus. And friends, let's look to Him today and realize that it's all about Him and we can resist and we can know victory in our lives. Friends, let's bow our heads together and pray. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for your blessing 
upon us today, Lord. Thank you for your word which lives and abides forever. Thank you today, Lord, that you are wonderful and that, Lord, you are strong and that, Lord, we can trust you for everything. Lord, your word always has the answer, always has the antidote, Lord, for our situations, our circumstances, and our problems. Lord, if we simply open your divine book, Lord, the answer's there, Lord, and we can apply it to our lives. Lord, we can take it and use it, Lord, not to be hearers only, but to be doers of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the victory that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And today, Lord, I pray for each and every one. And Lord, Lord, I pray in the Savior's name that, Lord, you'll have your way in our lives. People of God, as we continue in God's presence, right now, as you've heard the word of God today, even now, I pray that in your heart right now and in your soul, you begin to open up afresh to the Lord and say, Lord, I need more victories in my life. Friends, we've all had victories, but let's be honest, I'm sure you'll agree, we all need more victories. We all need more victories, and the victories are there if we want them. They're there if we do the necessary thing for it, and that is to use the Word of God and to live by it and to be these certain things that we will know. Brothers and sisters, today, right now, God's presence, even now in your heart, just, just look to the Lord right now, in the name of Jesus. Just look to the Lord. Just lift your, your, your face to heaven. You want to lift your hand to heaven, feel free to do it, friends, but look to the Lord, because He's willing to meet you at your point of need right now, because He knows what's going on, but you have to be the one that takes the step. The Lord is not going to do it automatically for you, child of God, you must initiate it. You must call upon the Lord. You must ask the Lord for his help. Say, Lord, undertake for me now, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Friends, we're going to pray together right now. I'm going to pray for you. And as we do, begin to lift your heart to Jesus. Father, I pray for each and everyone gathered in this, in this room today. But Lord, as we've heard your word, now, Lord, may we know the fruit of your word, Lord. May we know the reaction to your word, the doing of your word, the obedience of your word. We pray, O oh God, that out of this, great things will come, Lord, because it's you working in the lives of your people, Lord, as we surrender to you, as we submit to your ways. Lord, may your name be honored and glorified in our lives. And Lord, I pray that there'll be a tremendous impact in each of those who call upon you right now. And that, Lord, in a few moments when we leave this place, Lord, we will leave this place with the knowledge that we have done that and that we have called to you, Lord, and we've reached out by faith because we know, Lord, that we're to resist the devil, but, Lord, we're to draw near to you. We're to draw near to you, Lord, in every way that we know your, the pleasure of your presence and your hand upon our lives and your goodness to us in every way through grace and mercy. Here as we pray, and Lord, I ask we'll continue to live in the light of your precious word, all for the glory of our Savior Jesus. And everyone says, Amen. So be it. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening to his word this morning, friends. We're going to